On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen.
S-O-S, scoot over some. All right, and, and uh, I'm serious. If there's any way possible, if there's any seats, there are people all around trying to get in, trying to find a place. Uh, slide in some, will you? And then remember where you are and sit down there and leave the open seats out on the outside, okay? Brother Mark, give, a, give our welcome, if you will, okay? Amen. Hey, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're sliding, okay? You can even do a little move if you want to, all right? Thank you for doing that. And why don't you turn and greet those around you? Maybe somebody's about to come sit by you. Say hello to them as well. All right, if you would be seated. Normally we stand during baptism, but praise the Lord, we have 12 folks this morning. Amen. So even though you're seated, let's rejoice with them. Let them hear you. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. Actually, we have 13. So what a celebration. What a way to start our service today. Absolutely. And this morning, all these men and women coming before you today have made the decision to repent of their sins, believe that Jesus died and rose to save them, and have received Him as their Lord and Savior. And our first uh, two, actually, you've heard Pastor talk about this, is Paul Kinnean. Uh He and his son, just two weeks ago, uh, walked back to Guest Central and told Pastor, we've, my son and I both have given our life to the Lord today. And so I'm excited to start today to be able to baptize you, Paul. And Paul, it's because of the decision that you've made to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior that I baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. That's wonderful. Go ahead. And this is Son Turner. And Turner, it's as well because of the decision that you've made to trust Christ that I baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. All right, this is Sophia Lott. And Sophia, as well, because of the decision that you've made to trust Christ, I baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. Alright, this is Michaela Woodard. And Michaela, because of the decision that you've made to trust Christ, I baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. And this is Alexa Plowman. And Alexa, because of the decision that you've made to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, this morning I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of death, raised to walk in newness of life. And this is Brennan Butler. And Brennan, it's because of the decision that you've made to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior that I baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of death, raised to walk in newness of life. Now we have Joby Freeman. Joby, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. Is this? this is Kamasi Clark. 
It's my pleasure, Kamasi, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. Now we have Albany Clark, Albany White, <laughs> sorry about that, <laughs> Albany White. Uh, it's my pleasure to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. Now we have Cameron Bobbitt. It's my, present, my pleasure, Cameron, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. This is his brother, Philip Bobbitt. Go ahead and turn my hand. Philip, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. Now we have Mackenzie Webb. Mackenzie, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk the newness of life. Here's your faith. Now we have Christopher Holston. Go ahead and grab my hand, Christopher. It's my pleasure, my brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ unto death, raised to walk and new to survive. And all God's people said... Yes. 
is my victory. first memory as a child is my mom going to work and then coming home and my brother and sister's dad was standing at the door with a pistol and then uh, she came in late from work and he pistol whipped her. Me and my brother Jesse ran and jumped on top of her and he was hitting all three of us. I just got rebellious and then so I just kind of went me against the world and decided I was going to start doing drugs and drinking. Then you start stealing. The gangs kind of manipulated me into thinking that this is where I could be accepted. I did that for about eight years straight. I've been locked up in jail. I've been shot three times, but I've been stabbed seven times. I, I felt like my mind was slipping because I, I started not looking at trees as green and I didn't have feelings for nothing and I couldn't feel nothing. I numbed myself so much. So it scared me to a point where I, I decided to ask somebody for help. I actually was upset because once I got to the Warrior Center, I had realized um, it wasn't just a rehab. It was, uh, it was, it was giving out the gospel. A Bellevue minister on Thursday nights, they would have um, different speakers and stuff to come to the Warrior Center. So then that's when he said, well, what do you think about giving your life to Christ? And I, of course, I spent two weeks telling him no. He, he kind of like went, well, you know, are you scared? And then when he did that, are you scared to read the Bible? And I was like, I ain't scared of nothing, man. I, I thought, well, who's this guy? Throughout the years, I had several people try to talk to me about Christ. I thought I had committed so many sins that there was no way. He just said, man, just give it a try. He said, you, you tried everything else. You know, try this. And so I did. I gave my life to Christ. If I could tell you that there was thousands and thousands of pounds of pressure on me and didn't realize how much pressure was on me until I had confessed my sins. It, 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 it's, I can't even describe it, how light I felt. I learned that I went through a lot, but there's somebody out there that's going through something worse than me through uh, seeing what Jesus went through on the cross. So it's not, it's not all about me no more now that I'm with Christ. It's not how, it's not how it works. My mentor, who is uh, Bubba Taylor, uh, his dad is Gene Taylor. I met my mentors through the Warrior Center. It was a work program. They sent us to this house, so I knocked on the door. And I'm, I mean, my tattoos on my face were blaring, and they was darker than what they are now. I mean, I was in like cut off holy jeans, and I was like, hey, I'm here to work on your house. Catherine Taylor, who had, I call her Mama Cat, she went upstairs and got her husband and said, he's the, the ones outside, the guy that we're, we've been looking for is outside. I'm gonna tell you, I held back a lot at the beginning because I just didn't see myself being placed, or say like in Bellevue. I liked what Pastor Steve was saying. I thought, thought he was the, the best teacher in the world for me to listen to, but I just felt uncomfortable at first. You know, and the more I got to know people, the more loving they were, the more easier it got. And I got baptized March of 2016. You're buried with Jesus in baptism unto death and raised to walk in newness of life. Two and a half years ago, I was homeless, breaking into houses to sleep in empty abandoned houses. And now I'm married, I got both my kids, a high school teacher in Bellevue Baptist, recovery teacher at Salvation Army. And um, I got a lot of people that hold me accountable. I almost forget what I used to be. One of the big things about me knowing that I really had Christ in my life, I didn't have to question it. Because I started developing um, conviction, you know, just even in my thoughts. He wouldn't let me get away with nothing. I, I still got, I'm still working on things. I'm a work in progress. And I, and I, and I do believe that's probably going to be for the rest of my life. You know, always working on something. I think that's, that's the best relationship you can have with Christ is to always need him. Just know that there's nothing that you've done that, that, that God can't forgive you for. You know, every situation is different but it all leads back to one God and one Savior, Jesus Christ. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice of the same old lies. 
you're trying to feel the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day, day or night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fire. We've all run the things we know just ain't right. But there's a better life. There's a better life. Easter when they baptized so hard they knocked the lapel off of them. They knocked that little label. You see, how many of you saw that thing floating out there in the water? All right, amen. I tell you, when our guys baptize, you go down, amen. That big old tattooed arm, boom. Amen. You'll never forget that baptism, all right. <laughs> it's so good to have you today. Aren't you glad that Jesus is alive? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I tell you, I'm so glad I don't preach about a dead man. Amen. If you are here, which is all of you, we want you to do something. We want you to take the little card that's in your uh, bulletin and take it everybody. I don't care if you're a deacon, staff member. My wife even had to fill one of these out, all right? So I want you to fill it out, and we just want to know where you're from and all that, and we just appreciate you being here so much we have had uh, two services already one last night great group of folks worshiping hadn't this worship been fantastic i'm just telling you it's been great 
And uh, just, just the last service we did in this service too. We just thank you so much. Uh, everybody feel this out. Now do not put this in the offering plate. Where are you not going to put this? Thank you very much. All right. So uh, we don't want you to do that. Now normally we have a guest central and we have gift bags for everybody that you go get after the service and we don't kind of point you out. But we're, we're doing things different today. So all of you guys that are going to help me uh, give the gifts, uh, make sure the people behind you. If you are a guest, we want to give you a gift bag. Uh, bring me one of those just a second, Sam, if you will. I want to show you what they are real quick. All right. They've got, uh, of course, our, our sig signature statement here, Goo Goo Cluster. All right. Got to have that. We've got pens. We've got all kind of gifts in there. I, I don't have time to pull all this stuff out, but you will want it. And uh, if you're a guest, we, we never do this, but we're doing it today, so don't panic, okay? Uh, we're not going to just jump on you or anything like that, but we want to give you one of these per family. So raise your hand just so they're going to go back and give them to you. Raise your hand. Uh, one of them, one of these gift bags has a $100 bill in it, so just raise your hand. And, you know, when I said that in the other service, there, boy, I mean, our members started raising their hand. Amen? All right, so, you know, if you're, if you're a guest... They really don't have a $100 bill. Unless, unless, now, Sam is independently wealthy. He might put one in there, all right? So uh, if you want to hit Sam up, he's always got money. He's the one to rob if you ever want to rob him. That's, that's the guy right there, all right? So uh, I, I know he's going to love me for that. Hold your hand up so we can see who you are. All right. While they're doing that, we're almost through. Uh, next Sunday, we would love to invite you to something about 1230. It's called Lunch with the Pastor. It's also called Explore 101. And it's where we share with you the philosophy of Bellevue Baptist Church and how we do church and what our mission statement is. But not only that, how we want to get you involved in what God is doing in and through Bellevue Baptist Church. We're not an inward-looking church. We're an outward-looking church and an upward-looking church. We believe that we ought to pray. We believe Jesus is coming back, and we believe we ought to serve this city in His name, telling people about Jesus, finding a need in meeting it, finding a hurt in healing it, finding a point where we can connect with people and then somehow share the gospel with them. If you want to know more about our church, next Sunday, next Sunday, Explore 101. It's all in your bulletin as well. Uh, you can just uh, sign up, call, whatever you want to do, or just show up. It'll be right back in this area back here in Guest Central. Great barbecue lunch. And then I'll share with you just a little bit about uh, what our church is all about, okay? Thank you today. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll have our offering, and then we'll have another wonderful song, then I'm going to preach the Word of God. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for every soul that's here today. We love you and bless you. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.
Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, I hope that you've had a wonderful Easter weekend. Last night I said, I hope you'd have a wonderful Easter weekend. I have no idea why I said that. And I have no idea why I said it again today. But I thought it would. Don and I laughed till we cried last night when I got home about that. Aren't you glad that <laughs> you can have fun in church? Amen. 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I grew up uh, just north of here, a little town called Dyersburg. And uh, I can remember uh, every Christmas, I knew it was special, the birth of Jesus. But even as a little boy, I knew that there was something very special about Easter. I could just tell when my preacher, Dr. Orr, who baptized me when I was seven years old, I can remember how he would always wear a solid white suit, white shirt, white tie. He had white hair, and I think he even wore white shoes, if I'm not mistaken. But he came out, and he would, he would literally weep while he would preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I just want you to know there's no message like this in any other religion. We believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins. We believe that he was buried, but we believe that God supernaturally raised him from the dead. And we believe that he is alive. And, and why in the world would this many people come together, sing these great songs, come together and listen to somebody preach about a message that was uh, about a resurrected Lord because there's nothing else like this. Every other hero of every other religion is dead, but Jesus Christ is alive. And so that's why we come together every Sunday, but especially on this Sunday. I had one of my dear preacher friends from Nashville he texted me this morning about 5 o'clock. He said, hey, Steve, it's Super Bowl Sunday for every Christian. Amen. <laughs> and isn't that right? Isn't that what the, what the uh, Easter is all about, the Resurrection Sunday? Let's look there and see what Paul said about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. And I want you to notice how many times he uses the pronoun you. Look at this. Verse 1, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, the euangelion, the, where we get the word evangelism, the good news. I make known to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I have preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you. I think he's talking to you, don't you? I delivered to you as of first importance. In other words, of all the things I've written to you in all of my letters, Paul wrote half the New Testament, of all that I've written to you, this, what I'm about to say, is the most important. Here's what it is. What I also received. No, I'm giving you what I received. Here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared, these post-resurrection appearances, to Cephas, that's Peter, to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Some had, some had died by the time Paul wrote this. And then he said, he appeared also to James, that's the brother of Jesus, and to the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, Jesus appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, Paul said. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by 
the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Why do we celebrate Easter? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. First of all, in this text, Paul refers to what I want to call the characteristics of the gospel. The characteristics of the gospel. Look at verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. The gospel, what are its characteristics? Well, there are at least four given here. Number one, the gospel is to be proclaimed. You have to tell this. You can't sit on this. You can't just hold this to yourself. If you're a Christian and Jesus is in your heart, he's going to come out of your mouth. You can't have this kind of news and not share it. Look at verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. He's talking to the Corinthians. You can read about when he was on one of his missionary journeys and he went to Corinth. He had been to some other cities. He had been to Philippi. He had been beaten and thrown in jail while he was there. He started a church and he had been thrown in jail and then run out of town. He went to Thessalonica. They call it Thessaloniki there in Greece. And he started a church there and then he was run out of town. He goes to Berea. He starts a church there and he's run out of town. He goes to Athens which was like going to Princeton or someplace like that, a a very intellectual epicenter. And he goes there and he tells them about Jesus. People get saved. A small church starts and then he's not run out of town. He's laughed out of town. And he finds himself now in this immoral seaport city called Corinth. It has a sea on the north side a sea on the south side. It's located on an isthmus there. And along with those seaports came all kinds of immorality. In fact, in the first century, if somebody wanted to call you immoral, chances are if they were in the Roman Empire, they would call you a Corinthian. And so he goes there and he doesn't think much is going to happen. But all of a sudden, God just sets down. Aren't you amazed sometimes at how God does things that we don't understand and does things that we probably wouldn't have done it that way. I mean, if you're going to start a church, why, why don't you just have a great revival movement there in Athens so that all the intellectuals get saved and so it'll trickle down? Well, God says, that's not my way. My ways are not your ways, God says. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So he goes to corrupt Corinth where they had all kinds of, every kind of sexual immorality. And America is becoming more and more like Corinth all the time. And, and God goes there with this preacher named Paul, and all heaven breaks out. And all of a sudden, people are getting saved, and people are getting delivered, and people are getting set free, and people are coming out of sin, coming out of this, coming out of that. God's doing a great work, and God gives Paul a vision and said, hey, I've got many people here. That's before they were even saved. God knew what he was going to do. He said, I've got a lot of people here. And Paul stayed there for a year and a half and preached the gospel, taught the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is to be proclaimed. I can't tell you this without just saying, if you're a Christian, you're going to have these desires in your heart to tell other people about Christ. You just are. I'll give you an example. And I I don't give these examples to try to put myself up as some, you know, perfect Christian, but I, I do want you to know that I would never ask you to do something that I don't try to do myself. And so hopefully this will help you. I was walking into a breakfast meeting that I go to once a month with about a dozen other pastors and it was in a place that uh, the restaurant's on the top floor, and we, you go through this building, and right before you get to the elevators, there's this guard there, and he's kind of taking care of the building. I've been doing this 
with these pastors for about 10 or 11 years. And as I was walking in, it was just like the Holy Spirit said, uh, you've never witnessed to that guy. He said, how do you know that was the Lord? My flesh didn't say, you've never witnessed to that guy. And the devil didn't say, hey, you need to witness to that guy. So I, I, that, there's only one person left. That's the Lord, okay? And so I, 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 I said, Lord, you know, you want me to do it now? I said, no, do it, do it when you get, get through and you, you head on. I had a dental appointment and I, I was in a little bit of a rush on the way out. But I said, you know, I'll be glad my, my, my dentist is a Christian, and so if, if I miss an appointment with him, he'll understand. So, Lord, help me. And so I went up to this guy, and I started talking. He, he's so friendly. He talks to everybody that comes in there. He's just so nice. And I just started talking, and I said, hey, let me, can I, do you mind if I ask you a spiritual question? That's, that's how I try to turn a just regular conversation into a witnessing time. I said, do you mind if I just ask you a spiritual question? He said, no, I don't mind at all. I said, have you come to the place in your life where you know for sure that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? He said, man, I hope so. I said, well, now you don't have to hope so. You can know so. And I just shared with him my testimony. He said, well, I've been saved. I gave my heart to the Lord. He said, but I, I've gotten out of church, and I just hadn't gone a long time. We talked back and forth, and we finally prayed. I believe he's saved. I just don't believe he's really been growing that much. I invited him to Bellevue. He may be here today. I, I praise God if he is. But as I was walking out, this is the point of the whole thing. As I was walking out, in his booming voice, he said, hey, preacher. Thank you for caring about my soul. I'll never forget that until I die. And as I walked out, I said, Lord, <laughs> I should have cared about his soul 10 years ago. But don't you know that if you have Jesus in your heart, you've got to tell. I mean, this is a gospel that has to be proclaimed. And then this gospel has to be received. Not just proclaimed, but received. This is on the other end now. He said, verse 1, Now I make known to you, the brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received. Oh, the people of Corinth, they received Jesus. They received him into their lives. He became their Lord and their Savior. Can you imagine going to a place that, you know, has never heard the gospel and really doesn't understand the Old Testament scriptures, not a lot of Jewish people there, and all of a sudden, the power of God and the Spirit of God comes upon them so greatly that they just receive Christ. The Bible says in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as receive Jesus, to many as receive Him, to them He gives the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. How do you receive Christ? You receive Christ just like you receive somebody to be your spouse. You, you, you go to a, a wedding altar, if you will, and you give your commitment to them, you give your vow to them, they give their vow to you, and, and you receive one another. In, in fact, I believe with all of my heart, Brother Drew, that, that when somebody uh, gives their vow, a, a man gives his vow to his wife and, and she gives her vow, I think they're married already there before the preacher ever says, I now pronounce you. I believe God says, once you give that, and I think that the, right after that, what comes in a wedding, the wedding ring. I think the wedding ring is just symbolic of the fact that they're already husband and wife. And I believe that today, if you will receive Christ by faith, if you'll just receive Him, invite Him, the word lambano, it means to accept, it means to invite, come into my life, Lord Jesus, and change me. I receive you. I believe with all my heart, you'll walk out of here a different person. The gospel is to be proclaimed, and it's to be receive. And then what else? Another characteristic, it, it will strengthen you. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and they say, well, preacher, I, I want to be saved. I, I want to live for the Lord, but I just don't think I can be 100% all the time. I just don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. And I always agree with them. You can't, but Christ in you can some people put it off. I'm going to wait until I can deal with this sinful nature. Look, God has to deal with your sinful nature. God saves you from the inside out. Jesus comes to live within you, and you become a new creation, and not until then can you say, old things are gone, new things have come. 
Has Jesus made you a new creation? Has Jesus changed you? Has he strengthened you with his Holy Spirit? Look at verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. How can you stand for Christ in a world that more and more increasingly laughs at people that believe this book, laughs at people that goes to a church like Bellevue that preaches this book, that preaches that God is still doing miracles, that preaches that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How can you stand for the Lord in college when a professor would try to minimize, if not just totally destroy your whole faith in Jesus Christ? How can you take a stand when so many people are turning away from the church, turning away from the Lord in our society? How can you stand? I'll tell you how. This gospel, this good news, when you get saved, Jesus gives you the Holy Spirit and he strengthens you. He puts the power of God in you and all of a sudden you're living from the inside out. There's this power in you. There's this dunamis in you. There is this power and strength that you've never understood before and all of a sudden everything else everybody's doing, you don't want to do it. And everything they're not doing, that's what you want to do. And everywhere they're going, that's not where you want to go. And every, all these things that they're saying, that's not what you want to say. You just want to say what Jesus wants you to say. You want to be around the people of God. And you want to tell people about the Lord. And you want to help hurting people. And you're not thinking about yourself. And just putting away a lot of money so you can be rich and so you can retire rich and be a fat cat the rest of your life and all that. No, you're thinking about other people and you're wanting to give. You're constantly wanting to give stuff away and you just want to give your time away. And, and you, you love people that you didn't used to love and you don't care what the color of their skin is or where they live or anything else. You just love people. That's the strength of God in you that comes when you get born again. Don't you understand? This gospel changes lives. And, and not only that, but he just sums it up. He said, he said I told you, you got to proclaim it. You, you got to receive it. It's going to strengthen you. And bottom line is, guys, the gospel is just going to save you. It's just going to save you. Verse 2, by which also you were saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Oh, the beautiful characteristics of the gospel. But then he goes on and talks about the content of the gospel. I hear people say the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. What is the gospel? What is it? We know what it is. Verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Paul said, I'm not giving you anything that I haven't taken hold of, that Christ, here it is, number one, Christ, you know it's got to be of God, it's a three-point sermon, amen? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose, was raised on the third day, <coughs> excuse me, according to the Scriptures. First of all, the first part of the gospel, the first part of the content of the gospel is this, the death of Jesus. Verse 3. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is what so many of the Jews had a problem with. It was a, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the cross to the Jews is a stumbling block. To the Gentiles it is foolishness, but to us it is the power of God. Now what's going on there? Why? Why did the Jews, why was it a stumbling block? Because every Jew knew the Torah. He knew the first five books of the Bible, and he knew in Deuteronomy, the Bible says that anybody who hangs on a tree in death, anybody who is executed on a cross, if you will, is cursed of God. So the Messiah can't be cursed 
The Messiah is the anointed one. The Messiah is the one who is blessed, not cursed. So if Jesus was crucified, he automatically, that one thing for most Jews said, that disqualifies him from being the anointed one. He's not blessed of God. Obviously, he was cursed of God because he was crucified. And Paul said, you don't get it. He wasn't cursed of God for his sin. He was cursed of God for all of our sin. And he bore the curse that came upon Adam and Eve when they sinned and has been upon all humanity ever since. That curse that gives us that fleshly sinful desire to sin it's in every baby that's in every nursery we are automatically sinful because we have that curse but oh I tell you Jesus Christ became cursed of God so that you would never have to stay cursed of God you can be blessed of God because he became cursed of God he died on the cross in your place he bore your sin he bore your curse he bore hell itself on the cross so that you wouldn't have to go there forever nobody else did that for you Muhammad didn't do that for you Buddha didn't do that for you Confucius didn't do that for you. Steve Gaines didn't do that for you. No, Jesus did that for you. And he deserves all the praise and all the glory. First thing we talk about is the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. I tell you, Don't ever stop talking about the death of Jesus. And it was in, he said, it's according to the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. Where do you see it in the Old Testament? How about Isaiah 53, verse 6? All of us, like sheep, had gone astray. Each of us had turned his own way. But God, here it is, God laid the iniquity, the sin of us all upon him, the Messiah. Jesus, he bore your sin, he's paid the penalty. How many of you would get excited if all of a sudden you went home tomorrow and in your mail there's this letter that said, hey, I just want you to know I paid off all your debts. You're debt free. How many of you would get excited? Anybody there? Oh, come on. Come on. I got a better deal than that. All your sins have been paid for. Jesus died for them all. Bible says in 1 John 2, 2, look at this. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. He himself, Jesus, is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Hallelujah. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Oh, I thank God for the death of Jesus. But there's another part here I want you to see, and that is the burial of Jesus. Look at verse 4. Not only that he was crucified and died for our sins, but he was buried. Now, why is that important? It proves that he was really dead. A lot of liberals will say, well, he didn't really die. He was just uh, wounded, and he lived, and he went on, and a lot of them say he married Mary Magdalene, and they had children, all this stuff. I tell you what, people can go absolutely batty when they're trying to deny Scripture. Amen? The Bible says that he died, and I got news for you. In Rome, When they said, now kill this man, if you didn't kill him, they would kill you. I just want you to know that when the Romans killed somebody, they killed him. And he was buried, you ready, to prove that he was dead. Jesus died. Jesus went into the grave. He was really dead. That's why he mentions it so profoundly. He was crucified he died and then he was buried and then the resurrection of Jesus here's the content the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus look at the latter part of verse 4 and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures he was raised God raised him from the dead we read about it in Acts chapter 2 verse 27 when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost and he was quoting from Psalm 16 he said Here's why the Messiah had to be raised from the dead because he's talking about the Messiah talking to the Father because you 
Heavenly Father will not abandon my soul to Hades or to hell, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. God said, I'm not going to let you stay in that grave. I got news for you, folks. Jesus Christ bones are not still on this earth. Jesus Christ's body is not still somewhere decayed on this earth. Jesus Christ came out of that grave and he rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally, never to die again. Jesus Christ is alive. That's what we celebrate today. And that's good news and that's the content of the gospel. The Death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one more thing, the confirmation of the gospel. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again from the dead. And then for 40 days, he had a task before he ascended back to the Father to send the Holy Spirit back to the church. And that was to meet with his disciples. And 1 Corinthians 15 gives us six of these meetings, these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. First of all, he appeared to Peter. Remember the guy that denied him? You remember, remember when, when uh, Peter said, Oh, Lord, they all may deny you, but I won't. <laughs> I'll never do it. Those scallywags may, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stand with you if I have to die with you. How'd that turn out for him? Not too good. A little girl comes up. Aren't you one of them? I don't know him. The guy comes and says, weren't you with that bunch? I don't know him. Somebody else comes up. He's warming himself with the fire of the world, by the way. You have to be one of them because you're from Galilee. And let me just tell you what they basically were saying. You talk like a country hick. <laughs> That's what they were saying. That's what people say to me all the time. And he cursed and said, I don't know the man. And when he did, the rooster crowed. And Jesus, the Bible says, looked right at him. And he was broken and he wept. So when did Jesus appear to him? We know it was John 21, there at the Sea of Galilee. He takes him aside and he said, hey, hey now, now uh, Peter, remember what you said you love me so much, you're not going to deny me. Everybody else might, but you won't. Peter, do you love me? And there's three words for love, and I won't go into all that in the Greek language, but the first one was agape. That's John 3, 16, love. That's I'll die for you, love. That's the best, greatest love. That's God love. He said, do you agape me? Peter said, I thought I did, but I don't. I just phileo you. I love you like a brother. I love you like that, Lord. I, I thought that I agape you. I thought that I loved you with sacrificial love, but I don't. And he wept. And Jesus said, oh, okay, feed my sheep. Peter, I want to ask you again. This is very important. Now, why did he do it three times? Because, Jesus, because Peter denied him three times. And so he said, well, I want to ask you again. Now, do you agape me? One more time. You sure you don't agape me? Lord, and he starts breaking out. He said, you know that I phileo you. I thought that I agape you. I thought that I loved you with God's love, but I just love you with brotherly love. That's as much as I can muster up. God, I, I'm sorry. And Jesus said, okay, tend my lambs. And then the most beautiful thing, aren't you glad when Jesus comes down to our level? He meets you where you are to take you where you need to go. And Jesus came and he said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you there. Do you really phileo me? Do you, do you love me like a brother? And he just breaks down. He said, Lord, and he grabs it. He said, you know that I love you like a brother. I phileo you. Then feed my sheep. Oh, yeah. Peter got a visit. And then the 12 got a visit. You can read about that in all the Gospels. And then 500 got a visit. Verse 6, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. Some have fallen asleep. You know, a lot of people say, no, 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 no. There was only 120 Christians on the day of Pentecost. That's all there were. Well, there's at least 500 right here. I guess that's 500 in Sunday school and 120 in the prayer meeting. I don't know. 
It's kind of the ratio, isn't it? 500 people at one time saw him. And then James saw him. I wish I could have been there for that meeting. That was his brother, his younger brother, who became the pastor, the senior pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And he wrote, by the way, James' book is the greatest commentary on the Sermon on the Mount that there is. And James had grown up with Jesus, his older brother, and now he's bowing before him saying, you are the, the Messiah, you are the anointed one, you are the Christ, I submit my life to you. And he had not believed while Jesus, before Jesus was crucified and raised, but now he believes and Jesus appeared to him. And then he appeared to all the apostles, says in verse 7, but I'm trying to get to the last one, the sixth post-resurrection appearance mentioned here is, Paul says, he appeared also to me, he appeared to Paul. Look at verse 8. And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul had Christians imprisoned, beaten, and killed. And I'm going to ask you, if you have not, and I won't make any money for this, I'm not their little advertiser or anything like that, I'm going to ask you to go see the movie Paul, the Apostle of Christ. It will grip your heart. It's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. It's in theaters. I don't know. I know it's like the one at Cordova, but you need to go see it because Paul, in that movie, it shows him having these, these visions and these nightmares of these people that he had persecuted, a little girl that he had killed, a man that he had killed, a woman he had killed, and they keep coming up to him, and he wakes up, and he, he wakes up, and, you, and he, he just does what we do when the devil haunts us with our past. He said, one time he wakes up, he says, the grace of God is sufficient for me. The grace of God is sufficient for me. The grace of God is sufficient for me. It puts Paul in a real life, and Paul said, I persecuted, I killed Christians. I wasn't worthy to see the resurrected Lord. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, verse 10, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. And then he just went out, Paul did, and told everybody about the resurrected Lord. This last Friday, my sweet mother-in-law, Miss Dodds, her last sibling had died and we had the funeral. Ernestine Webster, Ernie, Aunt Ernie. She was 91 years old and uh, she died recently. And it blessed my heart that this woman who knew Jesus was buried on Good Friday, which is the day that we celebrate Jesus' death and burial. And you know, because of Jesus, I was able to say, we're putting this body in the grave. And Miss Dodds had, there were 10 of them. She had nine siblings. She's the last one of them. I said, we're putting this body in the grave. But her soul and spirit, because Jesus saved her already with the Lord, and this body is going to come out of the grave. I like that song, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. Amen? And why is that? Because Jesus was raised from the dead. I want to read to you about what's going to happen. Go to the end very quickly. This is it. Verse 51 in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. This is the coming of Christ. For the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on the immortal, immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written in the Old Testament, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, 
death. Where is your sting? Paul says, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. I have no idea what God has in store for America. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm 60 years old. If I live one more year or 30 more years, I'm dedicating my life to talking to the Lord and talking with the Lord and talking about the Lord to other people. I don't care about where I live. I don't care about what I drive. I don't care about what I wear. I just want God to wear me like a glove and use me to tell people that Jesus is alive. Let's bow for a moment. <laughs> Oh God, help us to tell others that Jesus is alive. The gates and doors are barred and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness, rose with every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow, Half in fear that day would find the soldiers coming through to drag us all away. Just before the sunlight, I heard something at the wall. The gates began to rattle, a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, I looked down into the street. Expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary. I went and let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said, they've moved him in the night and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away. And his body, it's not there. We both ran toward the garden. John ran on ahead. We found the stone at the empty tomb, just the way Mary said. And the winding sheet they'd wrapped him in was just an empty shell. Now or where they'd taken him, more than I could tell. Something strange had happened there, just what I did not know. John believed a miracle, I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. I saw them crucify him, and then I watched him die. Back inside the house again, my guilt and anguish came. Everything I'd promised him just added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it could never be the same. Oh, but suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume. Light that shone from everywhere drove shadows from that room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees. I clung to him and I cried. He raised me to my feet and I looked into those eyes 
Love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. My guilt and my confusion, it disappeared in a sweet release. And every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace. Jesus is alive. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now be seated just for a second. I'm not letting you out of here until we give people a chance to get saved. If you don't know the Lord, now is the time. When, when, when is going to be a better time for you to pray and receive Jesus into your life? Let's all bow our heads just for a moment. If you've never prayed and asked Christ to come into your life, I want you to do that right now. God wants you to do that right now. And some of you are ready. Holy Spirit's got you ready. Bellevue cares about your soul. We care about all of you. And I'd like to lead you to the Lord just like I would lead somebody in their wedding vows. God's promise to you is, if you will call upon my name in repentance and faith, I will save you. Would you just speak to him right now, right where you are? During this holy hush, that's the Lord. There in the balcony, God's speaking to you here on this main floor. In the midst of thousands of people, God is treating you, you're the only one. That's, that's what he's saying. You're the one he's speaking to. Receive Christ right now. Confess and repent of your sins. Pray something like this. Whether it's out loud or just to the Lord, he's right there with you. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn from it, Lord. I turn to you. And I believe that you died for me. I believe all my sin has been paid for. I believe that you rose from the dead. I really do believe that you're alive. Lord, I receive you right now. I'm unworthy, but I receive you. Come into my life. Save me, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Now with our heads bowed, for those of you who are Christians, you know you're saved, but you're not living for the Lord. Don't you think today would be a great time to just recommit your life to the Lord. You can't get saved again, but you can draw closer to the Lord. Why don't you do that? Pray something like this. Dear Lord, I, I thank you that I'm saved, but I'm not living for you as I should. God, forgive me. 
I repent. And Lord, I want for the rest of my life to talk with you and to talk about you to other people. God, use me. I'm not worthy, but use me, Lord. And I thank you that you love me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to do one thing. We're not going to have an altar call today. We know you need to go, and you've got all kind of things to do. And that's wonderful. We celebrate that with you. But some of you just made the biggest decision in your whole life. And the Bible talks about not being ashamed of Jesus. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father. So I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But I am going to ask you to do one thing. And it may be a little bit hard, but you know what? The Lord will help you. And how many of you in this room are grateful for anybody that just got saved? Anybody out there? Okay, now look. Amen. Look at me. You're, you're among friends. This, this, these, this is your family. We're, you're among friends, all right? I'm going to ask you. I, I'm asking you to do this, number one, for the Lord, but number two, for you. This will help you. This won't hurt you. This is not a show, but this will help you. If you'll take a stand, literally, I want you, I'm going to count a three count downward, all right? And when I ask you to stand, if you just prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, up in the balcony on this main floor, we had, all, we had 42 stand last night, all right? I'm going to ask you to stand up. And this place is going to, you know what it's going to sound like? It's going to sound like, it's going to sound like what it's going to sound like when you enter into heaven. Everybody's going to be shouting and, and your mama especially, amen. And, and everybody's going to be rejoicing and, and thanking God. Isn't that what you want to hear when you die? Well, you can hear a little, little taste of heaven right now. We want to celebrate with you. All right, you ready? Here's the countdown. I want you to stand up. Anybody can figure that out. Now, some of y'all need to start preparing for it. It takes me a while to get up. Amen. So, so just start preparing for it right now. Okay. Three, count with me. Two, one, stand up. If you just prayed to receive Christ, stand up. Anybody, anybody stand up. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Amen. 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 Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. Now, let me just give you a word, and we're going to be through, and y'all can go eat chicken or whatever. <laughs> you know, if I was a chicken, I'd hate every Baptist there was. Amen? Because <laughs> we, we kill more chickens than Tyson food. I'm telling you, we, we kill those chickens. All right. If you uh, just got saved, we want to give you a brand new Bible and a little booklet that I uh, wrote called Now That You're Saved. This is your gift. We have three areas where there are white tents. And our people out there, all you have to do, if you just got saved, there's a little check at the bottom of your card that says, Today I prayed to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Check that. Now, if you prayed with me to rededicate your life, there's a place for that. With all due respect, though, you don't get a Bible, all right? Just the people that got saved, all right? So, as you go out, here's all you have to do. You got saved. You prayed to receive Christ. You walk up to one of these tents. That's the south lobby. We have two of them there. We have one in each of the east and the west lobby. As you're walking out to your car, no big deal. Just walk up there, hand them the card at the tent. They will automatically hand you this, and you just keep. You don't even have to break stride if you're really good at it, all right? Just keep right on going. And you go to your house, your house and or wherever you're going to eat while we're still here having church. All right, whatever you, you want to do. The rest of you, if you did not do that, I want everybody to put their card right when you go out. There'll be buckets out here, and you'll do that. Hey, look at me. We had a great morning. Let's spend the rest of our lives talking with the Lord and about the Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. He is risen.
Amen. Have a great Easter. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.